Welcome to our last session on Jewish culture. Thanks for joining me in this journey through Jewish life, Jewish literature, Jewish music, and art. There are many Jews out there today, particularly in North America, who would define themselves as cultural Jews. But what do we mean by calling themselves cultural Jews? Well, on one hand, when they think about the things they do that are Jewish, they think about Jewish food, maybe listen to Jewish music, maybe they have Jewish art on their walls, maybe they have Jewish books on their shelves, maybe they celebrate holidays at home. They have Passover seders, Hanukkah parties, maybe they go to a synagogue once in a while, maybe not. Maybe they go to a Jewish film festival more often than they go to a synagogue. But in some ways, the label of cultural Jew is the, an alternate label to secular Jew. That is an alternate label to I'm not a synagogue Jew. So cultural is seen as almost in opposition to religious or institutional. If you're a cultural Jew, you do it at home. If you're a cultural Jew, you do it on your own. You do it with your family. Versus those religious Jews that do it in synagogue. Now, that line between culture and religion may not be as strict as people might think. After all, if you think of a religion as a revealed scripture, as something that came down from above to Moses on Mount Sinai or to the rabbis creating the Talmud, then you would see a real difference between the religious tenets, which do not change over time, and culture, which evolves over time, which is influenced by the outside community. After all, Jews in different parts of the globe dressed differently, ate different foods, spoke different languages, sang different songs, had a different ear for what good music was. They simply had different approaches to that everyday material life, as opposed to the spiritual life defined by religious ideology. Now, the challenge is that many of us today see religion as one more thing that's made by people that evolves over time, that changes in response to new environments. There's just one example. There's a scholar who studied the evolution of the use of the Kaddish prayer as part of services. And he noted that at the same time in medieval Europe, that the, the idea of buying indulgences, that you could do something for the church now that would save your loved one from more punishment in purgatory, the same time that was evolving in the Catholic church, the idea that reciting Kaddish for your deceased loved one could help shorten their time in judgment and get them into God Aden, into the Garden of Eden a little bit sooner. Is it a coincidence? Or is there maybe some lead over between those two? And of course, our religious ideology is affected by our environments and how we're living all the time. I was talking with someone just this week about the early period of Reform Judaism, which we talk about more in our Jewish history class, but in the early period of Reform Judaism, Jews were changing their ideology based on philosophy, study of history, but they were also changing their behavior based on sociology, their experiences with their neighbors, the fact that they could see what happened in a church and compare it to what happened in their synagogues and might decide to make some changes to make their synagogue more like the church. They might have framed it in terms of ideology, philosophy, enlightenment, but the effects might have well come from the sociology of the lived experience of being part of their surrounding culture and having the opportunity to be part of their surrounding culture. So culture and religion may be two sides of the same coin, or in fact, as we understand it, religion might be one aspect of a cultural Jewish identity. And as you connect to Jewish culture, it can include religion under that umbrella, as opposed to seeing them as an opposition or as one prioritizing the other is simply not as important. We've already seen in some of the discussions of Jewish language or Jewish food, the gender divisions of those two where religion was the province of men who were the rabbis and who wrote the sources and who did the praying in the synagogue most of the time. And women, while they came to synagogue occasionally and certainly were religious in their home in terms of maintaining dietary laws and family purity and reciting blessings, and they certainly had a religious lifestyle too. Nevertheless, that material culture of language and food was not as prized as the synagogue culture of religious ideology, theology, liturgy, and prayer. Well, we see culture as all important, uh, both the religious and the quote secular, uh, but most importantly, they are part of the lived experience of the Jewish people in many different times and places. So as a review, I thought we'd just take a look back 
at the um, sort of table of contents, so to speak, the, the topics that we covered, as you can see, this is an exploration of the varieties of ways to approach culture. So we began just after our high holidays with an introduction to the overview of what counts as Jewish culture and how we define those boundaries. We talked about holidays and for many cultural Jews, by the way, the high holidays are more about the Rosh Hashanah dinner than they are about Rosh Hashanah services because again, it's a family home experience. But from a cultural Judaism standpoint, Jewish holidays count as one expression, as one lived experience of Jewish culture. So we went through our major holidays, the Jewish New Year, Passover, Shavuot, and Sukkot, which are the three major pilgrimage festivals according to the Torah. Although these days Passover gets a lot more attention than Shavuot and Sukkot. In fact, I even hear people sometimes say, we celebrate the high holidays, Passover and Hanukkah. Now those are the big holidays in a North American context, given the surrounding culture's emphasis, those weren't historically the most important holidays. In fact, the most important ones were the Day of Atonement, there was no Rosh Hashanah in the Torah because the calendar changed, and the major pilgrimage festivals. And the holiday that comes more often than any other, and that's Shabbat. And we also talked a little bit about Purim uh, because we were, if not getting close to that season, um, at least it has a feel like Shabbat is a time of relief from the ordinary. Uh, Purim was a, an experience of oppression and then freedom. Of course, both Purim and Shabbat are we might call mythological holidays. They weren't agricultural harvest holidays like Shavuot and Sukkot. They were holidays based on a story, be it the creation story or the Purim story, which didn't happen in history, but certainly has a powerful mythology for Jewish life. Then we turn to uh, festivals around seasons. Uh, Hanukkah coming near the end of the year. It's at the, um, the end of the moon cycle closest to the winter solstice, so it's the darkest night of the year, if not the longest night, and to Bishvat, which is scheduled to the beginning of the budding of the trees and scheduled on the full moon of a month, as are some other holidays, perhaps having an old fertility resonance to it. We then talked about the fast days, part of the rabbinic calendar, and the modern holidays invented by the modern Jewish state and the modern Jewish experience. And then we turn to the life cycle, because after all, every culture has a way of marking birth and coming of age and partnering up and saying goodbye and the process of death and burial. Um, and while we may not share the ideology of the rabbinic Judaism that formed Jewish rituals around these events, we nevertheless maintain many of those symbols and rituals as they speak to us or as they can be reframed from a secular and humanistic perspective. Starting in February, we turn to Jewish literature. And we started with the oldest Jewish literature that we have, it is the Torah. We, there are inscriptions here and there we've dug up in the desert Occasionally they confirm the Torah, occasionally they disagree with the Torah's version of events, but this is our oldest collection of literature. And we understand the Torah as a very important book, an ancient book, and still a book written by people. We then turn to the broader canon of the Hebrew Bible, what's called the Tanakh, which stands for Torah, first five books, Nevi'im, the prophets, or the historical books and the prophets, and the Ketuvim, the other miscellaneous writings, including Proverbs and Psalms and the Book of Job and the Five Festival Scrolls and a couple other books that claim to retell the history as well. And then we looked at rabbinic literature because, of course, people didn't stop writing just because they closed a scriptural canon. The rabbis wrote blessings. They discussed laws. They told stories about their own daring deeds. And they grappled with the stories in the in that Hebrew Bible and their interpretations and sometimes their additions or emendations to those stories in the form of what's called Big Rosh. We also dealt a little more depth starting in March into liturgy, specifically that kind of liturgical language that the rabbis created, which defined the concept of prayer and blessing and uh, was a very important creation of Jewish culture. And then we turn to modern Jewish literature because of course Jews didn't stop writing after the rabbis either. Uh, we looked at examples of poetry, prose, um, and other versions of written Jewish culture continuing into the modern vein and into modern languages too, not only written in Jewish languages. We talked about some of the subtleties of those differences. Of course, Jewish creativity did not restrict itself to the written word. It does privilege the written word historically, but it's not limited to that. So we had sessions talking about movies. We had sessions talking about Jewish music and Jewish art, looking at the less verbal or even the nonverbal versions 
of expressing Jewish culture, be it from ritual art for a fancy kiddush cup or a menorah, or graphic art, representational art, even sculpture, which have now been opened up to Jewish practice in the modern world. We had a session talking about Jewish lifestyle, diet, dress, employment. We talked about different Jewish languages in different parts of the world and how Jews maintain their connection to their ancestral alphabet by writing new languages in old letters and bridging the gaps between the two. And in our last session, we looked at some of the wide varieties of Jewish culture beyond the Ashkenazi, Eastern European, the Sephardi or Spanish-based, and the Mizrahi, the Middle Eastern or Arabic, North African-based uh, cultures. We decided to go beyond those and look at some of the more exceptional cases like the Jews of China or the Jews of India or even the Jews of Yemen and Ethiopia. And then to try to find something out of those very, very disparate communities to ask the question, is there one Jewish culture or are there many Jewish cultures? Does it make sense to talk about a unified Jewish culture? And the example that I always give to put a point on that is if you wanted to talk about connecting to American food, what would that look like? Well, it would include Tex-Mex cuisine. It would include a California roll in American style sushi. It might include General Tso's chicken, which is an American Chinese dish. There is no General Tso you can find in China and he didn't make chicken in a special way. It includes Creole cooking in Louisiana. It includes um, uh, low country cooking in South Carolina. It includes uh, pizza. It includes hamburgers and hot dogs and all of that culture. You see, all of these are part of American culture in an umbrella understanding, even though they're very, very different with different influences and foods. Well, the same is going to be true for Jewish culture. There's a unified Jewish identity, be it biological in origin, or a cultural identification, or simply a claimed identity with this, whatever this Jewishness is. That peoplehood is a very vague concept, but sometimes ambiguity can be helpful. And so all of those different aspects have their elements in common and their disparate elements, but they are united by their claim to be part of one thing. So when we think about the broader picture of Jewish culture, and we look at our conclusion essay that is in the uh, course packet for the class, you see that there are many ways that we can choose to connect to that cultural heritage. We sometimes describe Jewish culture as the attic that we have inherited from our ancestors. And we get to choose from that attic what works well in our house. Maybe it needs a new frame, a new setting, and then it works, or maybe it works just fine the way it is, and we uh, use it in that way. And maybe there are parts of that cultural inheritance that don't speak to us. And we let other parts of the family uh, enjoy that experience. You see, when we try to create new culture, it has its challenges. But if we just kept the old culture the way it was, like a museum curator, that would have other challenges. It wouldn't agree with our approach to life and might, in fact, um, conflict with our own personal values. We would feel inauthentic putting on the clothing or dressing up or acting like our ancestors if we are animated by the same beliefs and values that they held very dearly. In fact, we're maintaining a Jewish tradition of integrity by changing what we've inherited to match our values. Of course, changing things has its own challenges too. You can't make something new be old. You can make it resonate with the old or be in harmony or have an affinity with the old, but it's not going to be ancient in the same way. And one of the big challenges that we face in the modern Jewish world as secular and humanistic Jews is that we are easily able to access the surrounding culture. In fact, all too easily on smartphones, on devices. I mean, it lets you watch this, but it also lets you watch anything else that you want to watch anytime you want to watch it. And the challenge is that now we're in competition with that surrounding culture, be it sports, opera, movies, all of the above, or none of the above, all of these compete with Jewish cultural events and opportunities for influence. You might become a fan of hip hop music. You might become a fan of bagpipe music. There's no limit to what you can experience. And the ghetto experiences we imagine it, the shtetl experiences we imagine it, of being a closed off bubble, well, we are so much more open to the surrounding world. They were open to it too, but we are even more so today. We have the access of language, but we also have the lack of barriers to our participation. There's a reason why Jews became very successful in television and movies and pop American culture in the 20th century. They've been striving for centuries to do so, they had been unable to do so by limitations. When the limitations were removed, they were able to be 
very successful. Now, another challenge that we face is that we have a real decline in intense Jewish ethnic experience. The freedom of American integration caused the decline of the intense Yiddish culture that animated American Judaism in the first part of the 20th century. And that was a loss. There was no way to sugarcoat it. America is where people come to learn English. When you look at uh, Latino communities or uh, Asian communities of all varieties, they often have trouble maintaining their language and culture into the third and the fourth generation. And the same is true for the ethnic Jewish experience. There are new waves of Russian Jews and Persian Jews and Israeli Jews now coming to the United States and they're bringing with them their distinctive Jewish cultures. But they will too face the same challenges of maintaining their language as their cultural identity and have to find some way to harmonize with the opportunities of soccer games and uh, dating with whoever you want uh, instead of the traditional isolated Jewish experience. Um, nowadays, many Jews do not pray three times a day. They attend some services at synagogues sometimes. They do major holidays. They might send their kid to a Sunday school through bar or bat mitzvah, but it becomes a part-time affair. <clears throat> Their Jewishness is part of who they are, not all of who they are. Jewish culture is how we've expressed our humanness, our humanity through the years, because we face the turning of the seasons and the need for harvest, the marking of time, the changing of the life cycle, the desire to express joy and celebrate and to mourn and to be creative through music and art and all the rest. Jewish culture is our way that we've done this and we've had a chance to study this all together. So looking at a few of our discussion questions, which I'll answer myself, how do secular humanistic Jews connect with historic Jewish culture, given that it may not reflect their beliefs and practices? Again, there's a discontinuity there at times. Well, we have to balance our creativity and our continuity. We use the best from the Jewish path that speaks to us most profoundly, but we're also willing to make some changes and adapt things if they don't fit beautifully, or we might even create our own versions that speak more to our values. Again, they may resonate with the traditional approach. Instead of Baruch Atah Adonai, blessed are you, our God, we might say Baruch Or Ba'olam, blessed is the light in the world that has the advantage of being a similar number of beats to the meter, so you could sing it to a traditional blessing melody as well. We want to meet the human needs that are served by the traditional liturgy but we want to do so in a way that speaks our words and our values so we can sing with our whole selves, both our mind and our emotional resonance. We can study traditional literature and traditional practices, both for their historical value, but also for the opportunity to know from what we are taking and changing. These are cultural artifacts of the Jewish experience. They're examples of the Jewish thought process. Second question. What are some of the challenges of creating new elements of culture and what are the benefits? Well, the major challenge is that when people are looking for meaningful cultural experiences, they're often looking for something traditional. They wanna feel traditional. They wanna feel like their ancestors are endorsing what they're doing, that their Bubby and their Zadie, their grandma and grandpa would have been proud of them. And sometimes that's easily done and sometimes that's not so easily done. You know, we have to balance between that feel of tradition, but also that honesty of living our own values. And if you create something new, it can feel kind of contrived or forced. People sometimes will describe our adapted blessings that we do humanistically, and we find them meaningful to us. But for them, it feels a little artificial, like singing, um, I bless America, instead of God bless America, really? It's more like a Weird Al Yankovic Perry song than it is a meaningful jazz riff on a melody or a rhapsody on a theme by Paganini. I mean, we're doing creativity, but sometimes creativity works for some and doesn't work for others. It's an aesthetic question, and there's no one opinion on an aesthetic question. Another challenge in creating new culture is that it requires some courage to do it. You know, you have to defend the fact that you've made changes, but it also requires a critical mass of people for it to feel authentic. If people don't buy it, if you're not saying it with people and you're doing it by yourself, you have the validity of your own experience, but it helps to be reinforced by other people who also find it meaningful. And there are times that others might reject your changes or condemn them. I mean, one of the advantages we have today in 
secular and humanist securities than we didn't have when we started 60 years ago, is there are many other people who are creating new versions of Jewish culture, Jewish feminists and the Jewish renewal movement. And there are other people who have taken that idea that we can change this text, which finally goes back to the reform movement in the 19th century. But now they're willing to even dive into those core formula and make them something different to reflect their values and what resonates with them. And we're part of that trend. Now, one other challenge that you face is that you might be separating yourself from the Jewish community. If everyone else says X and you say X plus two, it's going to be a little bit different. On the other hand, on the benefits side, if you are willing to create and you do have that courage and you do find a critical mass of people who like what you're doing, now you can clearly articulate what you believe and your values. You can respond directly to new circumstances instead of trying to fit the old culture into a new setting, like asking the old rabbi, is there a blessing for a Maserati? No, you can create your own. You don't have to try to fit an old one. Into, sometimes it's creative to fit the old to the new, but sometimes it's more satisfying to create a new for the new circumstance. And it also gives you a sense of ownership and authorship. Your Judaism is your own, in part because you've helped to create it. Again, you are not a museum curator. When you inherit the past, you own it, it is yours, and then you get to pass it down and your kids will do with it what they choose to do because they will be the owners. But you are not simply the custodian for this to keep it the same. You are an owner and you have the right of authorship too. And most importantly, uh, we're always creating culture. <laughs> People are always changing things. Even in the ultra-Orthodox world, they claim to have stopped the clock, but they've changed their own culture over the intervening decades and centuries since they claim to have stopped time. We have to remember that if what we do is to be relevant and powerful and meaningful, we want it to speak to us. And creating something new can enhance the power of that ritual, that ceremony. So you, sh you shouldn't have to say words you don't believe to light Hanukkah candles. If that really bothers you, or you find it just not meaningful, or you feel like you're going through the motions, then let's find something else. Let's create something else together that speaks to you and that you can use for your ritual. If it's the same ritual of lighting candles, it can be a new ritual infused with new language from your own creativity. Third, how has cultural competition affected Jewish culture and Jewish identity? Well, being Jewish might no longer be your primary personal identity. You know, you're involved in politics and uh, activism. Uh, your own leisure activities, your national citizenship, your employment, where you go for entertainment. These may all sometimes take precedence over your Jewishness and certainly compete with it for your attention and your dollar and your energies. You also might find that you have a wider variety of Jewish identities and experiences to choose from because this cultural competition in the general world sparks Jewish cultural creativity. If there were three main denominations of Judaism going back 100 years ago, if you had just performed conservative and orthodox, now you have half a dozen more that have evolved. There's secular and humanistic, there's uh, Jewish renewal, there's reconstructed Judaism, there's modern orthodox, which is separated, and open orthodox, which is even different from modern orthodox, and conservatox in the middle, and reformative in the middle of that, and non-denominational with egalitarian minions, and, all kinds of other options out there. Well, that's a function of cultural freedom and of the opportunity to create a new. Now, the other result of having cultural competition out there is that Jewish identity has to be more interesting. You can't just say you're stuck with this. We're just going to recite the same book over and over. You have to be attractive and interesting because you're competing with uh, Broadway and television shows and Netflix streaming and all the other entertainment opportunities out there. Because what we're doing is we are informing, we are inspiring, we are hopefully enlightening, but we are also entertaining. We have to do a little bit of all of it. And if what we're doing is informational but boring, then we're not gonna get very far. We have to sell Jewish identity to compete with other opportunities. And that's just the way things are. And people are going to pick and choose by circumstance and by event. If they like my program, they might come to me. If they like my neighbor synagogue program or the guest speaker they brought in or the music actor they've hired, they might go over there too. The labels and the institutional loyalties against all others are less important these days. And it's what's interesting that draws you in. In the world of internet Jewish programming and the post Zoom era, you have to be interesting to keep people's attention. Otherwise they'll go somewhere else.
How has the decline in ethnic Jewish culture and a dense ethnic Jewish experience affected modern Jewish identity? Well, ethnic Jewish behavior can be adopted or affected. I mean, you could try to learn Yiddish, you can you know, start to dress up in a different way than you did before. And there are people who actually re-enter an Orthodox Jewish lifestyle and really adopt that because in part, they want that intense communal experience in addition to the ideology. But it just becomes a challenge as Jews become more acculturated. I mean, I'll give you my own family example. On my mother's side, her, her grandparents were the immigrants from Eastern Europe who were fluent in Yiddish. Her mother grew up speaking Yiddish at home but never learned to read it. Her, uh, her own experience, she went to a Yiddish shola. She learned some Yiddish after school, but again, never was fully fluent in it. And then for me, I, know, I knew some words and phrases I wanted to study in college, but that's a different kind of study than learning it growing up or than having it spoken in the home as a natural first language, let alone a second language. And the same is true on my father's side with Arabic. His mother was fluent in Arabic. He knew it, he could understand it, but he didn't speak it to me. And so I know the swear words. <laughs> That's about as far as it goes. Now, the more uh, we've been integrated with the surrounding culture, we have a less visible Jewish identity in many cases. Uh, we might make it more important in the um, synagogue settings where people are more inclined to put on a kippah or a talis uh, when they're in a Jewish mode or a Jewish institution, but out in their daily world, they're not as obviously Jewish as we might have been, say, a hundred years ago. Uh, we also find that we can assume less knowledge and background as fewer people are having intense Jewish educational and institutional experiences or simply not raising families that are focused on Jewishness as much as they used to be. So now we can't assume that everybody knows what Google is or uh, how to spin a drain or what the letters mean when they walk in the door. They're coming from all different variety of experiences, including some with less Jewish literacy. And there's simply a, just a wider variety of Jewish experiences and families and origins now than there ever was. If you went back to the 1920s, the vast majority of American Jews had an Eastern European Jewish experience. There were German Jews, there were some Sephardi and Mizrahi Jews, but the overwhelming majority, I'm talking over 75%, had the Ashkenazi Yiddish language experience in their recent past. Nowadays, it's much more diverse, and there's a certain body of people, if you look at the latest uh, demographic studies that were done in 2020, who don't identify as Ashkenazi, Sephardi, Mizrahi, or any of them. They're just Jewish. Perhaps they converted into Jewish identity, and so they don't take an ethnic culture, but perhaps they simply are post-ethnic and don't connect with one or the other because they're just Jewish. And that's a change in Jewish life. Celebrating Jewish culture without the philosophical or ideological element can become tricky. You know, if you don't have an ideology of God gave you this material, and it's not simply, well, I'm just doing this because this is my ethnic culture, and I grew up with this language, and I ate all these foods, and this is what my uh, grandparents did with me. Well, if that's not the experience you have anymore, we can't assume that that's going to be the basis for a lasting secular Jewish identity. We have to find other reasons. Perhaps a humanistic philosophy is enough to marry to that Jewish heritage and uh, bring it forward. And time will tell. We will have to see. And finally, what were the most valuable cultural contributions of the Jews to the world? Which cultural contributions might we regret the most? Well, we'll start with their regrets. <laughs> Exclusive monotheism in some ways can be more intolerant to ancient religion or modern religion than ancient polytheism. If you had ancient polytheism, you have your gods, I have my gods, you have a hearth god, I have a hearth god, you've got a fertility goddess, I've got a fertility goddess, we call them different names. What's the big deal? To say, let's call the whole thing off, who cares? But if you have one god that only wants to be worshipped in one way, that has chosen one people as his nation of priests, that has a name you're not allowed to speak and an image you're not allowed to make, well, that's claiming exclusive truth in a way that polytheism didn't. Now, now, this is not to say that the Greeks and the Babylonians were wonderfully kind, generous, you know, uh, uh, kumbaya neighbors to their neighboring peoples. They fought and they killed just like other peoples did. But in some ways, monotheism has a particular edge to it that uh, adds a layer of fervor that wasn't there before. We certainly know the conquest texts in the book of Joshua and some of the pronouncements against the Canaanites in the book of Deuteronomy describe a kind of genocidal exclusivity, trying to wipe out the other peoples. Um, and if you claim that there is a canon of a timeless 
changeless revelation, that's assuming the truth doesn't change and values can't change. And well, sorry, that's life. If there is to be progress, things have to change. And sometimes that means scripture will lose by comparison. And we can also point out the idea of chosenness is something we're not proud of, but we're not really in that. The uh, Japanese consider themselves as the island of the gods. The, um, the uh, Greeks called everybody else barbarian. That was the word for non-Greek. So lots of people have thought they're the best of all people. So the Jews are like them only, uh, you know, just like everybody else. Now, debatable values. The Bible, well, it had a prophetic moralism. It had God, you know, uh, telling the prophets to tell the people that they were doing it wrong by being unjust and oppressing the poor. And, and values who might, might, might uh, cherish and celebrate. Uh, certainly, there are wonderful literary stories, not just in Genesis. I mean, there are the Genesis stories, but there's the narratives of David and Saul, fascinating political maneuvering. There's a lot, out, lot more out there to be found. Um, but we know that the Bible is also used to beat up people and to oppress people and to make people feel less worthy or uh, insufficient. Um, and so uh, it's, it's a mixed bag, I would say. What valuable contributions have we made? Well, we've certainly emphasized education, at least for men historically, now that's been brought to women as well, and it's been secularized from emphasizing religious education to emphasizing secular education. If you look at the demographics again, the number of percentage of Jews who get bachelor's and, uh, uh, and graduate degrees is way higher than the general proportion in the uh, American population. And that's, that's part of that secularization of education. We have this creative tension in Jewish life between identifying with and being alienated from the mainstream society. We are in it and yet not of it. Think about people like Freud or Einstein. This is a theory that Isaac Deutscher put out in his book, The Non-Jewish Jew, but I think it holds some water that there's the role of the Jew as part of the society and yet distinct from that society in some ways, and that creates a creative tension. Sean Wine writes in his history book, of Provocative People, about how Jews also pioneered the global ideology of globalism. I mean, not, not the anti-Semitic version of globalism, but the idea that you could have your own identity and yet be a citizen of many countries in the world um, and have connections with other people elsewhere. This is the kind of global world we live in now, where you might be an American expat living in Singapore, and so you're of Singapore, but you're also of Chicago, and you have roots in both places. Uh, this is the, the world of globalism that we've experienced at least in the first part of the 21st century, and Jews were pioneers in that global identity uh, approach. Some of them were tempted into the universalist humanist world of, I'm not Jewish anymore, I'm just a person, I'm just a citizen of the world, a cosmopolitan, while others maintained their Jewishness even as they had a foot in the wider world, and I think that is a uh, paradigm that will be of interest going forward in the 21st century. Um, certainly, our contributions that are particular to Jewish life, specific Jewish songs, Jewish humor, you know, these are elements that are important uh, for broader Western culture, not just for Jews. And the idea that the law is superior to a temporary power is something that I think is rather unique, if not unique. Um, in many ancient Near Eastern cultures, whenever the new king came in place, he could make his own laws. He often reaffirmed the previous king's laws just for stability, but he could make new laws if he chose to, as famously King Hammurabi did. But in the Torah, it says, if you have a king, he has to read this law book and follow it. The law is superior to the king. And that, I think, is an important progress in human development. I will not give Jews credit for inventing democracy. That's not true. And after all, I wouldn't even give America credit for inventing democracy until the 1960s, because so many people weren't able to vote in a meaningful way. Um, until that time period, you can't really call it a full representative democracy, and so much every population is ineligible to vote on their representatives. Well, that's it for Jewish culture. We've explored the past, we've talked about the present, we've tried to define parameters, we've tried to open up possibilities. I guess the last message to share with you is the idea that Jewish culture, if you are Jewish, if you want to participate in Jewish culture, is yours. It's yours to experience. It's yours to create. It's yours to inherit. It's yours to adapt. And it's yours to live. Culture only works if you're living it, if you're singing the song. Studying about the song is one thing. Singing the song is another experience entirely. And so I hope in your life, as you go through it, you find those expressions of Jewish culture and you find ways not just to study Jewish culture, but to live it and participate in it and to be a creator. Uh, you know, uh, at the beginning of the Genesis story, our first story, 
God says, let there be, and there is. And so hopefully in the future and today, Jewish people are able to say with their own courage and their own authenticity and their own sense of self-worth and ownership. Let there be this new Jewish culture and then it will be, and it will be very good. Thanks very much and happy studying and happy enjoying Jewish culture.